Welcome back. Thank you so much for continuing to watch with us. The following will be the completion of Professor Paul McCary's lecture, COVID-19, Immunity, Inflammation, and Intervention, as we did not have enough time during the prior webinar to complete his lecture. Please enjoy. Hello. Um, in a continuation of my presentation from last week on the inflammation um, immunity that underlies both protection and augmented disease in COVID-19. What I'd like to do now is um, quickly take you through how information is utilized from both of those spheres to inform intervention strategies for this particular disease. And um, what I'll do is I'll talk briefly about um, new medicines and drugs that are in different stages of either preclinical or clinical testing for COVID-19. Um, I won't go into that in too much detail because I'm not a pharmacologist and I think uh, an immunopharmacologist is, is going to be significantly better equipped than I am um, to provide specific information on those. But I, I, will share some, um, I will share some data on those. And then I'll talk in a little bit more detail about current vaccine strategies and, and where we're at um, for COVID-19. So when we think about um, medical intervention in the context of this disease, um, we know that there are really um, th three things that, that um, can be targeted um, with new medicines as part of the general principles for how you would treat this particular infection. So you can have medicines that target the virus um, directly. So these are medicines that will interfere with viral replication or block viral binding um, to host receptors in, in, in the airways. Um, there are medicines that are designed to target the um, underlying inflammatory pathways that, that drive a lot of the pathology and morbidity that's associated with this particular disease. And then the third category are medicines that are designed um, to either repair or protect the lungs. So these are things that are more geared towards um, treating the pneumonia um, that we associate with COVID-19. And if we look right now, um, this is just a snapshot of um, some of the drugs that are now being tested in these patients. There's really a blend um, of drugs that all fall into one of those three categories. Um, I won't go into these in any great detail, except to say that we're looking at a number of, of um, inhibitors for things like interleukin-6 as one of the principal um, molecules that drives the fever response in this disease. And again, it's, it's about trying to ameliorate or regulate um, the unwanted um, um, inflammation as, as part of the underlying pathology. Um, there are inhibitors that, that bind directly to things like the ACE2 receptor, and, and these function as antagonists that potentially block the binding of the virus to its target receptor. And then there are drugs that target um, the virus directly. And of course, most of you will have heard about um, the ongoing clinical studies on remdesivir and some of the positive data that's emerging from the clinical trials um, on this particular drug. So just as a little reminder, remdesivir, this is a, a nucleoside analog. It's an analog um, of adenosine. And this is essentially a drug that was developed by Gilead to target another RNA pathogen, which was HIV. And the way this drug works is it incorporates into the viral genome and basically shuts down um, virus, virus replication. Now, um, the, the, the initial trials that were done on remdesivir in, in China did not yield results that were particularly positive. Um, but there, there has been subsequent trials conducted um, in a combination of the US and, and some European countries where the data does look um, significantly more positive and, and the 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 summary of the positive effects for remdesivir um, are that um, it, it does reduce the um, morbidity and pathology in COVID-19. And things like hospitalization rates um, as a surrogate way of, of basically measuring morbidity of this disease can be reduced from about 14 days down to about 11 days in, in the treated patients versus the controls. Um, and that represents about a 30% reduction in the overall um, morbidity. So that, that is a, a positive outcome from those studies. Um, one of the other things that, that has emerged is that there wasn't really a significant impact on the mortality of the disease. 
So it is something that's having an impact on basically how ill the patient gets. But thus far, it doesn't seem to have a, a very significant impact on whether, whether the patients die or not. Um, so that tells us that there's significantly more work to be done. Um, my own take on what the likely um, outcome of all these clinical trials on new drugs is going to be um, is that one drug by itself is unlikely to be the solution to this particular disease. I think it's extremely likely that we'll end up with a cocktail and it's going to be a cocktail that will incorporate one component that will target the virus directly, like remdesivir, for example, and then this will be blended with other drugs that, that target either the inflammatory pathway, such as an interleukin-6 um, antagonist, and then something that maybe ameliorates the pneumonia that um, we observe in these patients. And, and these are things like VGF inhibitors um, and that Roche is pushing right now. Um, so if we move from medical intervention um, based on, on the, the, the application of um, drugs to treat this particular infection and then move into the vaccine sphere. I just want to start by um, giving a few general principles in vaccinology so that, that um, when reports emerge of um, ongoing vaccine trials, everyone has a clear idea about the type of vaccine. And, and when we're talking about correlates of um, protection, and, and immunity with, with vaccine approaches, um, how these are linked to the, the, the form and function of the vaccine that's, that's being utilized. So some general principles in vaccinology, the goal of all um, vaccinology is, is to engender herd immunity. Um, one of the best ways to think about vaccines is um, a, a vaccine is not something that's designed for an individual. Vaccines are always about populations rather than individuals. So when we think about a successful vaccine strategy, really what we're talking about is engendering herd immunity in a large enough proportion of our population to shut down the transmission of the infection. And, and the reason for that is that all vaccine responses in a population are quite heterogeneous. There will always be individuals that respond quite well to a vaccine and, and make a, a long-term protective response. And there will be individuals at the other end of the spectrum that respond poorly and remain susceptible. So what you're trying to do with your vaccine strategy is ensure that enough of your population have made a strong enough protective response so that those individuals that are still susceptible um, don't get exposed to the pathogen. And um, the, the, the number of people that you need to protect varies from pathogen to pathogen, and, and it can be influenced by things like the, the transmissibility um, and, and um, potential for infection for the pathogen. We don't know what the specific percentile is of the population that we need to protect for COVID-19, because this is data that normally emerges um, as part of the phase three trials that are done um, for new vaccines. But if it's anything like measles, for example, then we could be in a situation where we need about 85% of our population protected to, to ensure that the 15% that are still susceptible um, um, are protected by this principle of herd immunity. One of the other things that vaccines um, um, are designed to do is ensure that um, we have a long-term critical level of immunity um, in our population. And really what this pertains to is, is the requirement for periodic boosts. If a vaccine response is relatively weak and it provides transient um, protection, which can be for one or two years, then what this can translate into is a requirement to provide boosts Every, every few years as a way of ensuring that um, the critical levels of immunity are maintained within your population and herd immunity still applies. Um, now, another general rule of thumb in vaccinology is that the stronger the vaccine, um, the more dangerous it is. So what that means in practice is that um, a vaccine that engenders a really strong immune response um, in, in, in vaccinees is also unfortunately um, the type of vaccine that's most likely to cause um, unwanted adverse events. And basically when we think about uh, um, the various formats of vaccine that are used routinely in human populations, um, we move from um, things like live attenuated viral pathogens. So this is where we make a, a form of the original pathogen 
that, that basically causes a weak infection. And these, in general terms, are the strongest types of vaccine that we currently use in human populations. And um, examples of this include things like uh, measles, mumps, rubella, polio, and so on. Um, one step down from live attenuated viral pathogens, um, we have killed viral pathogens. So this is where you take the virus that's causing um, the disease, you basically culture it in gigantic volumes, and then you treat this virus in such a way that it's rendered uninfective. And there's various ways that you can do that. You can heat treat it, you can treat it with very harsh chemicals. And by doing this, you end up with a, a vaccine formulation that's composed of the original pathogen, but the pathogen's no longer infective. And these are, these are also very powerful types of vaccine that are used um, routinely in human populations. The seasonal influenza virus um, and, and, and vaccine um, is a very good example of this. And then one step down from there, what we have are things called pseudoviruses and, and, and virus-like particles. So this is taking relatively safe viruses and then engineering them in such a way that they express antigens from the pathogen that you're interested in. So what that allows you to do is take a, 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 a viral um, vector, like adenovirus, that, that is relatively, relatively safe to use in human populations. But what you're doing is you're coating it with targets from the pathogen that, that, that's causing the outbreak and then trying to engender an immune response against those targets as part of a vaccine response. One step down from um, pseudovirus and VLPs, we have what are called subunit vaccines. So this is where you'll take individual proteins um, or components that are derived from the pathogen these things are then expressed as recombinant formulations, and then that is what you inject into the patient um, to try and engender an immune response. These are generally quite weak forms of vaccination. The best example that I can give for this is the, the hepatitis B um, vaccine, which practically everyone in Singapore gets very early on in life. And, and um, one of the things that you'll know about the HPV vaccine is it's not a single shot. Um, you get your initial immunization um, in the first few days of life, and then what you get are um, two booster shots after that, separated by months. And, and the booster shots are required essentially to augment the effects of what's quite a, a weak um, vaccine formulation. And then we have DNA and RNA vaccines, um, which are also very safe to use in human populations. Now, the only issue with DNA and RNA vaccines is that they're relatively straightforward things um, to, to, to make and, and um, synthesize and manufacture. Um, but the, the biggest issue with this type of, of um, vaccine is thus far, there are no licensed vaccines that are based on a DNA or, or an RNA format that are used routinely in human populations. There are veterinary applications for these vaccines, but there's, the, there's been a, a, a significant degree of failure when it comes to looking at the basic efficacy of DNA and RNA vaccines in clinical trials. Um, so it's important to understand that whilst these are, are, are safe um, and relatively easy to manufacture, um, they generally have relatively poor efficacy when we start employing them in dedicated clinical studies. And um, I, I think, again, this is an important piece of information that, that you need to understand in the context of a lot of the vaccines that are currently in either preclinical or clinical development in the context of COVID-19. Now, one of the, the, the key sort of challenges that um, has to be addressed as part of running a vaccine trial is the time it takes to basically measure the efficacy of your vaccine formulation. Um, one of the, the, the things that's important to understand is that most vaccine trials are epidemiological in nature. Now, what this means in practice is that you have your candidate vaccine, you then recruit a very large number of volunteers who are given this vaccine, and then these volunteers are basically sent off home. And um, what you're waiting for is for these individuals to be exposed to the natural pathogen as part of their everyday lives. Now, in the context of COVID-19, of course, there's an additional complication here. And the additional complication is you're vaccinating 
a large group of individuals, you're sending them home, but you're sending them home into circumstances um, where there, there are very stringent lockdown and isolation policies that have been enacted, principally to stop their exposure um, to the, the, the circulating pathogen. So, of course, this can complicate the length of time it takes for you to um, identify enough infected individuals in the control groups in your vaccine study so that you can do a, a statistically powered calculation to look at whether your vaccine has any efficacy or not in terms of engendering protection in the group of people that you've vaccinated. So this is an important consideration that, that underlies the time it takes in vaccine development. Of course, in the context of COVID-19, because we're basically working under emergency um, um, and considerations, it means everything is speeded up. And um, best case scenario, we are still looking at probably early to mid 2021 for the completion of the, the phase three trials that are currently underway for a number of vaccine candidates. And if, if one looks at the blend of new candidates that, that are basically going into clinical development um, for, for vaccines for COVID-19, what we find is that, that there's a small number of the attenuated um, viral vaccines um, and much larger numbers of the formulations that I mentioned earlier tend to be safer but have left efficacy. So it's an important thing to remember when we're looking at the vaccine approaches that are being used for COVID-19. Okay, so um, I put these slides together a week ago and they're already out of date. So a week ago, these were the five vaccines that are currently in clinical trials um, for COVID-19. Um, we have two inactivated um, viral vectors, both of which are linked to ongoing studies in China. Um, we have one non-replicating vector that's based on an adenovirus scaffold, which expresses the spike protein from um, the COVID-19 virus. And then we have a, a DNA vaccine um, um, study and an RNA vaccine study. And these are all trials that are re currently recruiting patients and are now underway. Um, if we think about the, the, the other vaccine formulations that are in clinical development, most of these are still in what we call the preclinical stage of development where they aren't being used in patients yet or in volunteers yet, but they're going to be soon. So they're, they're going through the preclinical phase where the relative safety and efficacy of the vaccine formulation is being tested in things like animal models um, for deployment in human populations soon. So if we think about the, the types of vaccine formats that I mentioned earlier, we have the um, attenuated, live attenuated pathogen, um, which is just a weakened form of the COVID-19 virus. And then we have the inactivated virus, which is the COVID-19 virus, which has either been heat treated or treated with harsh chemicals um, to basically stop its infectivity. And if we look at um, the number of vaccines that are now in this preclinical stage of development, there are 71 that I've identified. Um, and these blend all of the different formats that I mentioned earlier. So in terms of live attenuated formats, there's only been one that I've identified thus far. Um, and that's a study that's going on between a vaccine company, um, Codagenics, with the Serum Institute of India. And what these guys are working on right now are ways of taking the COVID-19 virus, mutating it to make it less virulent, and, and, and in so doing develop a, a form of this, this pathogen um, that can be cultured in large quantities and can be relatively safe to give um, to human populations. So this will be a live attenuated um, virus vaccine, um, but this is still in the preclinical development stage. Um, in terms of inactivated viruses, aside from the two trials which are currently underway, um, there are two other formulations um, which are inactivated viruses, which are, are, are gonna be moving into the patient studies very soon, but they're still in the, um, the, the preclinical stage. Um, if we move to the next sort of format of, of um, vaccine, we have the, the, the viral vectors. And this is either taking replicating viral vectors and um, the, the usual type of vectors that are used for this type of approach are things like the weak, weakened measles vaccine, um, virus. So this is taking the, the, the measles virus that's currently used as the measles vaccine, but now taking that virus and cloning in 
genes from the COVID-19 virus. So the, the, this weakened measles virus now expresses antigens from the SARS-2 CoV. And then this can be given as a vaccine to patients or to volunteers. And the idea is that you're, you're trying to stimulate a, an immune response against the COVID-19 antigens that are now displayed on the surface of this weakened uh, measles um, virus. And we also use non-replicating viral vectors um, such as adenovirus. And again, these, this is taking adenovirus and cloning in antigens from the COVID-19 virus and then culturing these in, in huge numbers um, and activating them through things like heat treatment or chemical modification. And then these are given as vaccine formulations to the patient. And there are a large number of trials which are in preclinical pre stage um, based on exactly these approaches. So these include um, the adenoviral vectors from um, Oxford University, which has been widely publicized. So at the time I put these slides together, they weren't, they weren't at the stage where they were, were recruiting volunteers. Um, I was informed last night that they have just started recruiting. So these guys are now moving into um, clinical trials. Um, another interesting approach that's being used is uh, uh, an, an influenza um, um, viral vaccine that's, the, that's coming out of the University of Hong Kong, where they're taking the flu vaccine and cloning in the genes from COVID-19. So you now have a flu virus that's displaying COVID-19 antigens on its surface. And one of the interesting things about this particular approach is um, they're planning to give this as an aerosol um, exposure to the, 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 the vaccine formulation um, as a way to try and engender the right kind of mucosal immune response um, that would be, be required to protect um, volunteers from COVID-19. So there's a large number of um, this type of format that's, that's in preclinical development and there's going to be a large group of clinical trials initiated in the very near future um, where they'll be looking for volunteers uh, basically to be exposed. Um, to these particular um, vaccine formulations. Subunit vaccines are, basic, are based on taking components of the COVID-19 virus, like the spike protein or the receptor binding domain or other proteins that, that cover the surface of the COVID-19 virus. These proteins are made recombinantly in large fermenters, so you'll make literally kilograms of this material. And then these proteins um, can basically be delivered into volunteers as a way to try and stimulate immune responses against the individual proteins. And then this is a way that you can potentially engender protective responses against um, the original virus. And there are a large number of um, trials that are currently planned that are in preclinical -pre development all principally based on using the spike protein or parts of the spike protein from the COVID-19 virus. And then these are mixed with things that we call adjuvants, which are just basically immune potentiating um, cocktails. And, and adjuvants are mixed with the S protein and then injected um, into volunteers as a way to try and stimulate things like antibody responses and T cell responses that target the spike protein from the COVID-19 virus with the assumption that these would then be protective when you're exposed to the live virus. Um, and then we have DNA and RNA vaccines. Um, with DNA vaccines, you're basically making a plasmid that encodes part of the COVID-19 virus. And again, it's usually the spike protein that's being utilized for this. This plasmid is then injected um, usually into the muscles of um, volunteer vaccinees. And then the idea is that, that when you inject these plasmids that encode proteins that are derived from the COVID-19 virus, these plasmids will be transcribed and translated in the vaccinees. You get a localized production of the COVID-19 proteins, and then this can engender an immune response that is potentially protective against the wild type virus. And a, a similar principle is used in the context of RNA va um, vaccines. So this is where you're taking a strand of RNA, again, which will encode a component from the COVID-19 virus, usually the S protein, and then this is either given as naked RNA or can be encapsulated in li liposomes, um, so lipid droplets, and, and delivered um, into volunteers as a way of trying to get 
localized um, production of the viral antigen and engendering an immune response against those vir viral antigens that's potentially protective. And these are the DNA vaccines that are currently um, in preclinical development. And these are the RNA um, and vaccines that are currently in preclinical development. So a reasonable number of both of these formats are going to be tested out um, in volunteers. Okay, so some further thoughts on um, what's going on in vaccines for COVID-19. So it's quite likely that we've missed the first wave of the pandemic and, and um, the real utility for the vaccines that are currently going through clinical development is going to be in the second wave or maybe a little bit later. So when we're looking at uh, the, the post-pandemic phase and thinking about what's going to happen when we get the next coronavirus outbreak, okay, are we better prepared with all the work that's gone in um, to, to making different vaccine formats for this particular um, pathogen? Um, based on emergency use protocols, the, the current estimate is that we could have um, our first data emerging at the end of phase three trials by early 2021, which could see the vaccines being rolled out by mid to late 2021. So that's the kind of timeframes. Um, the best case scenario we're gonna be looking at um, for vaccines for COVID-19. Um, one thing that is important to remember is um, this virus doesn't respect boundaries or borders. And, and we are going to see an explosion of cases in um, basically low-income countries. So we have to make sure that if we want to protect ourselves as people that live in a high-income country, that the guys in the low-income countries also get access to the vaccines. Because if they're not protected, then neither are we. Um, so I, I think a fair vaccine allocation system is it has to be applied in the context of this disease. Either everyone's protected or no one's protected. And this goes back to a point that Professor Tambaya made in, in, in his earlier presentation as part of this lecture series. And the other thing that um, I, I think is important to, to understand is we've got to learn from our mistakes. So after the SARS outbreak, um, a lot of the research that was going in to vaccine development and into understanding the pathophysiology um, of that particular coronavirus infection, a lot of the research basically died off because it just became impossible to get funding um, to support research on a pathogen that was considered essentially defunct. Um, so I think we have to learn a lesson from this. This isn't the last co coronavirus um, that's going to cause a pandemic in human populations. So I think we have the opportunity now to invest properly in vaccine development and in R&D to understand the infection and immunity, the host pathogen interactions, so that we are much better equipped to deal with any future coronavirus outbreaks that might occur. And then just a final point is, I mean, I, I try and be an optimist about all this stuff. I think what we're seeing right now is a genuinely unprecedented level of intergovernmental, interscience, interclinician um, interaction and collaboration that, that crosses countries, boundaries, continents. We haven't seen anything like this before. I mean, the idea that within four months of an outbreak being announced, that we would have 75 vaccine formulations at different stages of clinical development is absolutely unprecedented. So I, I, I feel very positive about this. I think it's quite likely that by 2021, we will have um, a, a vaccine formulation that, that can be utilized in human, human populations to provide protection. And um, on that positive note, I'm going to end my talk and I'll finish there. Thank you.